Before I start my talk, I have a question. I was thinking about the Harvard Bridge story the other day. I found myself telling the story about 433 scoots in a year to the Boston coach driver that was taking me over to Harvard. And, you know, something occurred to me. Um, if I knew the conversion factor for smoots to centimeters, I could put it in the units database of the Linux utility. <laughs> <laughs> and I would do this thing if anybody would tell me how many centimeters in a smoot. Does anybody know this figure? I would, I would calculate it in about four foot eight. But that was a rough estimate years ago. <laughs> well, that's short, huh? Uh, well, if anybody, if anybody can dig up a smooths to centimeters or a smooths to inches conversion factor, I will get it into the Linux uti uh, unit utility conversions database. Can you just go out with a tape measure on the bridge to see where they Well, yeah, but no, actually, I want somebody to tell me what the length of the canonical smooth platinum bar in Walton, Paris. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, you have to know at what temperature? At, yeah, at, 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 yeah, at room temperature. 20 degrees the, <laughs> the temperature it normally is in New England. So, <laughs> okay, so uh, there are a couple different topics I can cover tonight. Uh, in order to know what I should emphasize and in what order, I need to know some things about this audience. Uh, I guess the first question is, how many of you have read the Cathedral of the Bazaar? Okay, most of you. How many people have read Homesteading the Newest here? Some of you. How many people have read The Magic Cauldron? Okay, not very many of you. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, has, um, has any, how many people here have heard me give my talk before? A fair number of you. You only have one talk. <laughs> heard me do my, okay, I don't have one talk. <laughs> What I have is a set of generative procedures in my head, which I execute with different initial conditions depending on the composition of the audience. <laughs> Unfortunately, enough of you have seen me give my talk before that it looks like I'm going to have to make up new jokes, which just sucks. <laughs> okay, uh, all right, so I have four modules that I can do. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm going to list them now and uh, decide which one you're primarily interested in and I'll, I'll ask for a show of hands and that will help me decide what emphasis to give things. Also, um, what's our formal stop time on this? Nine o'clock. I'll need to be up by 9.30 so we should probably wrap things up around right nine. Okay, good, fine. All right, so the four modules I can do are one, basic bizarre tactics and development strategy. Okay, that's the software engineering part. Two is anthropology, sociology, and cultural analysis about the culture that uh, surrounds this development method and how and, and why that culture is sustainable and interesting. Um, three is economics and business models uh, and the general theory of when to be open and when to be closed. And four is advocacy techniques, how to communicate and sell the idea of open source to people who don't get it yet. Right, so thinking about those, See a show of hands on each other. How many people's primary answers to within the software strategy and why it works and how it works and what you can do to improve it? Okay. Uh, how many people are primarily interested in hearing about cultural anthropology and motivational structures and culture and stuff? Okay. How many people are interested in economics, business models, and how you make money out of this stuff? Okay. And uh, how many people are interested in effective advocacy techniques and how to sell the idea? Okay. I think the advocacy people have won by a narrow margin. Is that the one you gave at the Geek Squad Festival? Uh, I gave a very abbreviated version of the advocacy talk there. Right. So that's sort of a five minute version. Um, so, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, that helps me, um, helps me know what order to do things in. So, uh, oh, oh, yes. Uh, finally, um, forget about formal question and answer at the end. This is all question and answer. Uh, this is a small enough group that if you just, if I say something that particularly amuses or puzzles you, uh, or you, you want more clarification on that, uh, wave a hand or send up a signal rocket or something and I'll, I'll try to respond. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to see past these lights, but I'll, I'll try to be aware of it. Okay, uh, where do I start? Well, um, I usually like to start uh, by talking about the way this happened to me. Uh, 
Ex experiences that confirm your worldview don't tend to teach you very much. It's experiences that suddenly turn your worldview upside down, that teach you what you don't know, that can really illuminate things and change your life. And that's the experience, the kind of experience I had in fall 1993 when I first encountered the Linux operating system. And I mean, oh, this is a Linux users group, so I mean, most of you know how cool Linux is and, and, and why it's cool. But um, the contrast for me was really startling because at that time I didn't have any Linux experience yet by definition. And what I did have was a lot of history in, in, as, a, as a software developer in a fairly conventional mode, in addition to my you know, free software experience, which goes back to my own community. But I, I had a lot of experience doing software in a conventional mode. Um, and that conventional mode teaches you a set of development tactics that are, that are completely op the opposite of what we normally use. And the way I usually put it is we do things the opposite of the normal way. And the, the, the traditional software development style is all founded on the maxim called Brooks's Law, okay, which predicts adding more programmers to a late project makes it later. <laughs> more generally, Brooks's Law predicts that if you have n programmers on a project, the amount of work you can get done scales roughly with n. So, so many people, so many person hours available, so many lines of code you can write. Um, but the, your problems, your vulnerability to bugs, and your management difficulties are going to scale roughly with n squared. Okay. Why is this? Well, anybody who's done serious development work, which is to say development work involving more than one person, <laughs> will have learned that bugs tend to cluster at the interfaces between pieces of code written by different people. Okay. Anybody who's done management on any multi-person project will also have learned that management problems tend to cluster at the interfaces between people. Okay. Accordingly, your problems and your vulnerabilities on a software development project tend to scale up not with the number of people on the project, but with the number of communications paths between the people. Okay. And let's consider how that scales. One person, no external communications paths. Two people, one path. Three people, three paths. Four people, six paths. Five people, ten paths. We're seeing a pattern here. Okay. Uh, the number of communications paths goes up as the quantity n, time, uh, n times quantity n minus 1 over 2. But we can ignore the lower order terms and just say it rises as n squared. Okay. Um, and because this is true, in the classical uh, mode of software development, what I labeled the cathedral mode because like, I needed a label for it, <laughs> um, this, uh, this, this terror of the n squared combinatorial explosion leads to a, a particular set of prescriptions. The first one of which is you need to keep your software development group as small as possible so that n squared overhead doesn't overwhelm you. Uh, and the second prescription is you need to <coughs> tightly and carefully manage the behavior of that group and its, contracts, uh, its contacts with the rest of the world so it doesn't get distracted. You're terrified of complexity. You're terrified of distraction. You're terrified of anything that would take the group's focus off its initially defined objectives. The third consequence of Brooks's law, which is less direct but still pretty powerful, is long intervals between releases. Why is this? Well, you've only got a small group of people who are working on the project, if you hypothesize a particular number of bugs in that mass of code, since you've got relatively few people looking at them, it follows that each person on the project has to spend a long time looking for the bugs. And this is true uh, to a, a sufficient extent that if you have like a six month time frame on a project, if you're lucky under conventional practice, you may get a, a month, a month and a half to explore novel areas of the problem space and think about new ways to do things and consider architecture. And then you get the, and, and, and implement. Then you get to spend the other four, uh, four and a half months looking for bugs. Okay. Actually, if it's a typical six-month project, you get to spend the other six months looking for uh, bugs. But that's a different story. Uh, so. Um, 
Because I knew all these things, because I sort of soaked them up through my pores, when Linux first showed up on my doorstep, I was deeply skeptical. Matter of fact, it, it was Yggdrasil that showed up on my doorstep, the Yggdrasil, the first CD-ROM distribution. And I pulled it out of its mailing envelope, and I sat it on my the corner of my desk, and for quite some time, it looked at me, and I looked at it, and neither of us really liked what we saw. <laughs> Because the one thing that I knew about Linux was that it had been developed by a disorganized mob of 40,000 semi-amateur programmers with no central control of objectives at all and really short release intervals. And I thought to myself, well, you know, I love this tribe. I've been part of it for, for 13 years. And I know we can produce good software. but..." A system this size, developed by methods like that, it's going to be a disaster. It's going to be a mess. I thought that what I would see if I ever booted up the thing was something that was sort of episodically quirky uh, and brilliant in spots, but basically unusable for any kind of production work. So eventually I got off my butt and I installed a CD-ROM drive in my, my PC. This was the late Paleolithic before PCs were too much hang with those things. Uh, and uh, and I, I inserted the thing and, and brought it up in demo mode, and I was absolutely astonished because, well, I mean, well there's still a two-inch divot in the floor of my office when I jog it. Uh, that's because it was good. Right? And I could tell it was good in a couple of different ways. One way was by what I saw there. I, I saw lots of, of tools that I was familiar with. I saw GCC, I saw GB, I saw Emacs. I, I saw all the standard internet stuff. I, I even saw a lot of my own code. Well, not that that's any guarantee of quality, but it sure, <laughs> gave, me a nice, it sure gave me a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling. Uh, and the other way that I could tell it was good uh, was by what I didn't see. I didn't see elaborate crash recovery tools. <laughs> <laughs> pretty impressive, and in fact, I was sufficiently impressed that I, I straight away, I, I had been running a, 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 a Dell System 5 Unix. Nobody remembers this, but Dell used to have its own PC Unix port. That's what I was running at the time. Scrapped that Dell Unix off my machine, installed Linux, and never looked back. And at that point, I made two mighty vows, one of which is, um, I'm going to become part of this community, or more part of it, in the sense I already was. I mean, I got that big result because my code was on there. I'm going to become uh, more deeply involved with this community. But more importantly than that, I'm going to figure out how they're getting away with it. Because clearly, um, either I'm experiencing a sort of weird mirage, or something basic that I think I know about software engineering is just wrong, just completely backwards. And if that's the case, I really kind of want to figure out what's wrong. So I studied the community for three years, uh, and I, I participated as a developer and, and as writing documentation. I, I wrote code, I maintained how-tos, and I didn't tell anybody that while I was cooperating with them, I was also studying them. <laughs> People tend to get a little weird when they know they're under observation. I didn't want to uh, perturb their behavior. Okay, so I didn't tell them I was also being an anthropologist. Uh, but I had done this before. I, I, I have a history of, of doing agricultural anthropology that goes back to the early 1990s when I did the New Hackers Dictionary. That was my first venture and it was a pretty successful one. It kind of gave me confidence that I could, I could get good results in analyzing this problem. So uh, after three years, I began to feel like I was getting a handle on what was going on. And, uh, and uh, that led to the paper that you probably all know about if you haven't read it, The Cathedral in the Bazaar. Uh, and I'm not going to rehash all of the, the conclusions of The Cathedral in the Bazaar. By now, I'm is there anybody here who doesn't understand the, uh, the claim, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow? Is that confusing to anybody at this point? <coughs> no? OK, then I don't have to rehash all that. Um, instead, I'm going to talk about some historical connections, which I 
in retrospect, don't think I emphasized enough at the time I wrote the paper. Um, there's been a lot of talk to the effect that, that bizarre mode development is something fundamentally yeah. wrecked. What was that? I'm giggling at bizarre mode development. Okay. Um, <laughs> there's been a lot of talk uh, to the effect that, that the bizarre mode of development is something fundamentally weird and radical and new and novel and groundbreaking and revolutionary. And there's a, sort of, there's a level on which that's true, but these days, I, I like to emphasize that it's really a rediscovery of a relatively old pattern. It's really, it's really a rediscovery of best practice in other engineering fields. And what I mean by that is that we have a, a, a 400-year tradition now. We know that human beings, when they're doing very complex creative work, they're in a, they're in a situation where not only don't you know the answers in advance, you don't even necessarily really well under, understand the questions well in advance until you've explored the problem domain. And we know that in that kind of situation, human beings are very prone to failure. They're very prone to making assumptions that they don't question. They're very prone to missing stuff. They're very prone to being uh, misled by their own theories. So uh, we've evolved a set of social mechanisms for hedging against the risk of human design and execution failure when you're doing experimental science or, or uh, complex sorts of engineering. And what we've evolved over the last 400 years is, is institutionalized peer review. If you are a scientist and you have, a, if you're a physicist, say, and you have a novel theory about uh, uh, the mass of the neutrino, or you're a biologist and you've uh, evolved some new, new theory about you know, pheromone signaling among harvester ants, okay? you can develop an elegant theory, you can, uh, you can develop a wonderful experiment that's very sharp at testing the theory. You can get results at over a 95% level of confidence. You can write a wonderful literate paper about what you've discovered and how you verified it. But none of that is going to be considered part of the edifice of knowledge that other researchers can build upon. None of it's going to be considered confirmed knowledge until those results, and not just the results, but your experimental plans, your source code, have been reviewed by experts who were not part of your original experimental group. Now, bringing it in closer to engineering, if you are a civil engineer and you are proposing to build a, uh, a suspension bid, bridge or a hydroelectric dam, a, a high-cost, high-risk project, people will die if you screw up. Okay? You are not going to get to string wire or pour concrete, typically, before your, not, not just your stress calculation results, but your blueprints, your source code, has been reviewed by engineers who were not part of your original design group. Okay. Why do we do this? We don't want suspension, suspension bridges to fall down. It's bad when that happens. Okay. And we found, over a couple centuries' experience, that the most effective way to prevent that from happening is to make the whole process of building suspension bridges transparent, top to bottom, from the blueprints up, and then to subject every level of that process to a rigorous, independent peer review. Against this historical context, the interesting question isn't, um, it's, it's, um, the interesting question is why are we doing um, open source development now? The interesting question is why weren't we doing it before? How did we lose this best practice? How did we lose sight of the importance of peer review in verifying complex designs? And that's an especially interesting question because all along, over the last 30 years, we have had one big example of the largest, most complex system of cooperating computer programs in existence, which nevertheless managed to function at five or six times reliability over pretty much its entire lifetime, in spite of the fact that it was multi-platform, multi-vendor, supported populations of widely varying levels of expertise and interests, did all the things that conventional software vendors say are so difficult that they won't even give you a warranty of merchantability. And yet it just kept on ticking. What I'm referring to, of course, is the core software of the internet itself, which has been developed in a, in a transparent open source process since its beginnings in 1969. 
So this is why I say that really open source development is a, a reconnection with what we already know about best practice and other forms of engineering. And that makes, by the way, a great argument to use with your boss sometime. Uh, if you've got the background in engineering or experimental science to appreciate it. So, um, any questions about that? The question. Yeah. Uh, well, I was just thinking of a counterexample. I mean, automobiles are designed in a fairly closed, proprietary uh, system, and they're an example of something that is, um, you know, sort of don't want to fail. Uh, they are also, automobiles as engineering designs also have several orders of magnitude more lower complexity than even moderate sized software systems. So the, 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 uh, the premium on peer review is much lower. You don't need peer review if all you're designing is, you know, is a club or a doorstop because the design is intrinsically simple. Yep. Fred, Bro Fred Brooks was a bright guy. Why wasn't this obvious to him? Uh, in fact, there is some evidence that Fred Brooks noticed this effect, but he didn't weight it sufficiently. In the Mythical Man Month, there is a line where he says, 40% of your bugs tend to be found by the users after the product is in the field. He even said, in a sentence immediately afterwards, more users find more bugs. So he, did, he noticed the, this effect, but he didn't realize that it could be scaled up into an effective means of amplification. But why not? I mean... I think I know why not. Because he didn't have the internet. Transaction costs, the multi-platform software didn't exist at the time. And the transaction costs necessary to put together a sufficiently large review group were something nobody could afford. And he just didn't think that the engineering history that you talked about with bridges and whatnot... He didn't see that it was relevant. Um, and um, I can't blame him too hard for that. I didn't see it was relevant for very damn long, and I was looking at the problem. I was specifically focusing on the issue. Um, I, but Brooks, nevertheless, Brooks almost got it. There was somebody else who almost got it. Um, and I'm an MIT guy, as it happens, and then later see I'm here, a guy named Richard Gabriel. He wrote a paper in 1989 called Good News, Bad News, and How to Win Big. And this was a paper addressing certain <coughs> theological disputes in the Lisp community. Uh, but one of the things he talked about in the paper was he drew a contrast between what he called the MIT style of design and the New Jersey style of design. <laughs> uh, and he was talking about Unix at the time. He, uh, he, that's what he was obliquely going after with the New Jersey style of design. He said in the MIT style of design, you build these huge, elegant, crystalline, perfect systems where you're taking great care with the design and engineering at all levels, and you release nothing until it's perfect. He said in the New Jersey style of, of design, you pile a succession of kludges on top of each other, but each kludge is just enough to attract user interest, and you count on the users to like whack you into making things better. He almost got it. In fact, the first time that uh, I, it, as it happens, I knew him before I wrote, I wrote my paper. Uh, we, we collaborated on the New Hackers Dictionary. And the first time that I ran into him face to face after the, the Cathedral of the Bazaar kind of exploded on everybody, and that was more of a surprise to me than anybody else, I think, by the way. Um, we, 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 actually, we actually thought about this for a while, and to this day, neither Richard nor I is sure whether I got my idea from this paper. We have not been able to figure this out. It, it could have happened that way, but neither of us is sure. Uh, oh, by, by the way, there's another related point, which is, this is something that's not in my book, which was I recently figured out the answer to a question which bothered me for years, which is why nobody wrote the Cathedral of the Bazaar before I did. Why nobody inside our community got it sooner than I did. And the reason this has bothering, been bothering for me for years is, okay, so like, I don't think I'm stupid. I have the same ration, ration of native arrogance as the rest of you. But I don't think that I'm uniquely brilliant either. And I don't think I'm the only planet, I, I don't think I am or ever was the only person on the planet with the right knowledge base to write those papers. And I was, uh, I was on the road in, I think it was in Norway, and I was sitting in my hotel room writing something, and I suddenly realized why nobody wrote the Cathedral of the Bazaar before I did. It's because the Hackett community had a hypothesis to explain why we write better code than it was comfortable with. 
And that hypothesis seemed so plausible and so comfortable that nobody before me ever looked beyond it. The hypothesis was, of course we write better code. We're geniuses. <laughs> <laughs> seductive thing about this hypothesis is it's not even wrong. Okay? <laughs> it's not even correct. It's just not sufficient to explain the observed results. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so let's see, what should I talk about? Uh, Ask a question. Yeah, sorry. You, you referred to Gabriel's so also known as was his, as was his better on paper. Yeah. And you made the point basically you do easier implementation rather than providing complex elaborate value time interfaces. So you yep. just go the easy way yourself and make it simple. Now the point is that actually most people interpret it that way that this describes how Microsoft develops its software. That's the most frequent interpretation of it that I've heard in recent, uh, recent times. The most because they, they do exactly that. It's not um, beautiful, perfect, whatsoever, yeah, finalized implementation. They just push it out. Somebody oh, down here points out that it's different from Gabriel's method because they don't fix the bugs. I'm asking seriously what Microsoft obviously is to also let us users discover the bugs, obviously, right. but they don't do like, don't go open source. So why does your argument strictly relate to open source and not just to pushing out software hoping you have a uh. large enough user base and they figure it out? Remember, I, I, keep, I kept talking about the importance of the, of the process being transparent from top to bottom. In order for peer review to, be, to work, no aspect of the process can be off limits to review. And in the Microsoft world, the most important, part of the, the, the most important product, which is the source code, the most important um, um, nexus of information is something you can't see. <coughs> excoriated people for, for sharing what he called stealing code because he said it would rob programmers of their livelihood, not allow companies to form and so forth and so on. Well, yeah. It's proposed that uh, Microsoft open their source code as part of the antitrust settlement. Uh, do you have a reaction or a prediction of what this could entail? Never happened. It doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> no, I, uh, we're going we're gonna to take Microsoft down before the Justice Department gets a final verdict. So I, I, <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, Maybe, maybe I should talk about that now. Um, I'm not just saying that to like, you know, pump everybody's blood up and exhibit my revolutionary art. I really believe that. Uh, and maybe I, this would be a good time to explain why. Um, well, let's see. Go on. Huh? Before you go on, I just would like to address the, the level of question. Yeah. I give it a little bit of thought. And, well, the period of innovation within the automobile industry was when there was a lot of competitors back in the 20s. And when consolidation happened, the innovation stopped. And you look at Tucker back in the 40s and how the big three tried to stop on Tucker. And then you look at the innovation in terms of automobile design, basically stagnating in terms of safety features as well as getting better fuel mileage. Until the Japanese came in and basically trounced the big three, and then they have to wake up. And they basically, I think it's, it's in, in a way, it is a kind of a peer review when the Japanese came in and then they say, oh, let's look at, take a look at their technology. And in a way, that's what Microsoft does. They kind of wait for somebody to, to innovate have better technology and they try to kind of reverse engineer it. We'll buy it. We'll buy it. We'll buy it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, one more question that we got to go forward. It is still on the, the top before you get to Microsoft. So peer review is possible in, in many other technical fields because you can patent that which you're creating and you can expose it and have other people look at without them being able to steal what it is you're building and, and taking the value from it. With software, though you can copyright the software, a lot of the kind of algorithms and, and structure of the software, 
can then just be taken by the people reviewing it. You can do that in software too. Maybe you shouldn't be able to. But you right, right. Well, my, my question is, do you feel that there should be a, another set, uh, I, I realize, of course, you're, you're very open, open source, but uh, that under different circumstances, had the laws been designed uh, to protect, to allow people to kind of patent their software, uh, we could see a lot of the benefits of peer review uh, under different circumstances? No. Nope. Nope. I, I, I don't know the answer to that question, and I have to say that I don't regard it as a very interesting one. Because, with, with all due respect to you, because I think the benefits of open source are sufficiently economically strong that they're independent of whether your ideas get stolen or not. They're still viable even if your ideas get stolen. I'll go into that later when I talk about um, when I talk about um, um, well, I'm going to I hope I, I hope to get to this later when I talk to economics. Why uh, why I talk about it when I talk about economics? I hope to have a chance to explain why you want your competition to copy what you're doing. It actually helps you when that happens. Um, Okay, but let's talk about the, uh, the, the seven bullets that Microsoft has to dodge to survive the next year. <laughs> um, I used to say the next 18 months, but that was six months ago. Oh. <laughs> um, okay, bullet number one is the Department of Justice lawsuit. We all know what kind of a problem that can cause them. I won't belabor the point. I actually think this is the slowest bullet and the easiest one for them to duck. So I'm not going to worry about further. Um, Here's another bullet. Uh, the Financial Accounting Standards Board is considering a change in the rules governing the, uh, the accounting of employee stock options. I see a head nodding here. <laughs> that would require companies to carry employee stock options as a charge against expenses. If this rule change went through, the Economist documented in 1999 the fact that it would change Microsoft's $4.5 billion reported profits for 1998 into an $18 billion loss. Hello. <laughs> so if this rules change goes through, it's going to become apparent that Microsoft actually isn't making any money. I know that sounds really weird, uh, but that's the way the logic works out. And of course, if, if it looks like Microsoft's making big losses every year, the stock price, the, 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 the market discounts their future earnings, the stock price crashes, Again. the option machine seizes up, all their people bail out, it's game over. Okay. Which is an important point because because of, this, because of the stock option exposure, Microsoft is extremely vulnerable to anything that causes a serious dip in its stock price. Of course, the other consequence of this big folding is that they're now a popular. Yes. Yeah. Interesting point. If the options aren't worth anything, then the charge against profits goes away. That's right. <laughs> 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 they become profitable after they lose all their employees. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Anyway, there's, a, there's a lot of companies that operate without you know, significant options and. and and titillating, you know, things that stay on with that. A lot of people want to work just for the jobs for later yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the thing is that there's been a, there, it's observable. We're jealous as hell, but. Uh. Yeah. It's, a, it's empirically observable that as the expected future value of those options has been dropping in the last six months, lots of Microsoft's best, best people have been leaving. Uh, so that's already starting to erode the series of. Okay, uh, third bullet. Can I have a question? Yeah. If all the stock options in Microsoft are exercised tomorrow, does Microsoft have to buy that stock on the open market or can they just issue treasury stock? I don't know the answer to that. It's treasury stock. It's already issued. It dilutes all the other outstanding shares. Right. At which point, and the dilution of the other outstanding shares could trigger the crash. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because people would sell before it got to live. It doesn't Microsoft's cash position. Yeah. Well, the thing is, Microsoft's cash position looks huge, but it's really fairly small relative to its exposure if it had to carry that as the options in the charging of the expenses. But it's still, it, it affects stock all directly. The yeah. company still has a bunch of cash to do what it wants to do. Yeah. Um, okay, third bullet. Um, it's not widely, it's been reported in the trade 
press, but most people seem to have forgotten that um, Microsoft is under SEC investigation for cooking its books. Um, it has been plausibly alleged, there's strong circumstantial evidence, that if um, that um, they've been engaging in a practice called cookie jar accounting, where you sh illegally shift revenues between quarters in order to make your revenue curve look smoother than it is. Okay. Now, the SEC has been investigating these charges for nearly two years. Um, we can probably, ex if they're going to bring charges, we can probably expect them to do it in the next six months or, go, or so, given the history of previous SEC investigations. If those charges are brought, um, some fairly high-ranking people at Microsoft are likely to go to jail. But the worst effect is that if those charges um, um, uh, go to court and the government wins a victory, the market is going to draw the, draw the conclusion that Microsoft's profit figures since 1995 have been smoking bullshit. Again, stock crash. Okay. Um, another problem Microsoft has is that its operating system strategy is a shambles. It's a disaster. They are not capturing any share in the high growth markets. PDAs, appliances, don't make me laugh. Servers, Linux is eating my lunch there. They're maintaining their desktop monopoly, but that's all they're doing. <laughs> and Microsoft needs constant uh, market growth in order to keep its revenues going up. Because every time it sells um, uh, Windows to somebody, it's now competing against itself. It gets no more, more money from that customer until they buy an upgrade. So they need constant market growth in order to keep their revenues up. Um, now we get to, now they make, by some, a, deft, adroit, twisted business tactics and, and political muscle and so forth, they might manage to dodge all of these. Okay? It's, it's, it's folly to underestimate Microsoft. They're very smart, they're very tough-minded, they're very agile. However, there's a seventh bullet they can't dodge. And here's how that goes. Um, they're, Microsoft, first of all, realized that Microsoft doesn't care about the retail software market. They could lose all their retail software market profits tomorrow, and they wouldn't care, except for the possibility that that would lose them some, some mind share. Okay? The reason is that their bread and butter has always been the white box OEMs. The people who ship hundreds of thousands of PCs a month. What they rely on is the willingness of those OEMs to pay $70 to $80 a pop in Microsoft tax for every machine that they ship. There is a problem here. The problem is hardware prices are dropping like a rock. $70 to $80 Microsoft tax doesn't look like a big bite out of your gross margin if the typical system go going off of your loading dock is going to sell for $2,500. When your typical system price is at about $800, headed down in the near term towards $500, and you can see when it's going to be $350, $80 is a big deal. As hardware prices continue to drop, um, the, the cost of a, a Windows license, uh, even at OEM prices, gets closer and closer to being an intolerable white out of gro gross margins. Extrapolating the price curve forward and, and looking at historical trends and saying, if prices keep dropping as fast, what will the price be at time t? We can see that the margin bite is going to become intolerable. It's going to force the OEMs to, to, to start defecting in a big way uh, sometime in the first quarter of 2001. Okay. I am not the only person to have followed through this logic. I have suspected for some months that Corel Linux, which right now looks like a retail product, is really aimed at the white box OEM market. That fundamentally, Corel doesn't care how many people buy it at CompUSA. What they really want, I've suspected for, for four months now, that what they really want is they see this crunch coming, and they want to be standing in the wings wearing tight white tulle and carrying roses when the OEMs decide they can't take it anymore. At which point they go, look, 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 I've got a stable, wonderful operating system and it's got a Microsoft compatible office suite on it. Take me, I'm yours, I'm much cheaper. Okay. Uh, six days ago in Montreal, I cornered Michael Kaplan and I asked him, 
fess up. Is this really what you're doing? And he grinned at me and said, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> so this is why I don't consider Microsoft a long-term problem. So would you sell me into short term stock? Um question. The question was what would I short Microsoft stock at this point? I've seriously considered it. The problem is I don't know that much about the mechanics of investment and I'm not even sure how you go about doing that. Um, but I certainly wouldn't buy any Microsoft stock. <laughs> yeah. I'm just curious um, how you feel about Corel. I'm a, I'm a little concerned about them, frankly, because I feel that uh, they do want to do what you're saying, and they want to, uh, you know, get their Office Suite products in the market and their, uh, you know, photo editing products in the market, and those are all closed source software products. Does that mean it's almost going to end up, you know, cutting legs out from down? very legitimate, interesting projects? They're out there like the gym or uh, clicks or... Why do you say that? Why does them selling a closed photo of your project cut the legs out from under the GIMP? Because I think the GIMP is a little buggy. Um, and it... Um, well, I'll fix it. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole Internet Explorer or Netscape uh, debate kind of illustrates that your average home user is basically lazy. They're going to use what is... That with doesn't the matter. It doesn't matter how many free riders want to play with binary software. The only thing that matters is whether there's a sufficiently large developer community that is interested. So, I mean, I, don't, I just don't think it matters at all. Now, the future may prove me wrong, but that's, that's my best judgment at this point. You and your buddy so hateful of the evil empire that we wouldn't touch Windows code because it's Infectious. I don't know. What, what, what would the reaction be? Okay, I take it you're from outside the Linux community. Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, not, not outside of, of the physics community. Okay, <laughs> okay, then, okay. My answer, and people here may differ with me on this, is that we have a, a loud minority who would refuse to touch Windows code um, because it's unclean. <laughs> and we have a large majority who would refuse to touch Windows code because it's too ugly to deal with. Do you understand the difference between those <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, I, in fact, do not think there are too many developers, open source developers, who would be willing to touch Windows code, but I don't think the reasons are religious ones. I think they'd see it as a waste of time and effort. Well, if somebody did yeah. on SourceForge. Well, well tied, tied into that is uh, one of the things that I've been thinking about a long time since I first started talking about Microsoft antitrust is uh, one of the angles they have not gone down is the fact that when Microsoft is uh, reducing Windows back even to 3.1, it was uncovered that they did not fully disclose the API and they used right. elements in their API that they didn't release to, they, they used elements in their, of their API in their, in their applications that they did not talk about with other uh, developers. They didn't publish those. Um, I don't see even if, you know, the Lord God, you know, pointed his finger at Microsoft and said, you know, release your source code, that you would get everything. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it would depend on the strictness of the conduct remedy. But I will say this. Um, forcing the source open would have one important benefit for not just our community, but for everybody. It would make it impossible for Microsoft to play the embrace extend and extinguish game. Because you'd have access to the code they were actually using. Mm -hmm. Yes? about the extend part of that, uh, I'm curious to comment on uh, post-publishing uh, uh, developments on the Netscape uh, client. Would I care to publish on what though? Uh, after the book, the book version came out, uh, there have been developments in Netscape. Uh, the book version of what? Oh, the book, my, my book. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, post-publishing developments in, well, I mean, they've, finally got it together enough to issue a beta. I mean, what else can I say about that? <laughs> it's a good thing. I'm happy. Is there Am I wrong that there are, are uh, unhappy people at AOL uh, who are not uh, entirely philosophically on board with the, the expressing standards as the basis for the uh, new client? Uh, that may be true, but I have no knowledge that it's true. 
I have no indicate I have no information to indicate that that's the case. There was a thing in Slash Dot about three or four weeks ago about Wise, the display maker, abandoning uh, Linux and going to Microsoft products because they were having driver problems. Does this ring a bell at all? No. No, oh, sorry. <laughs> Anybody else know anything about that? I didn't hear what he said. He said there was a story in Slashdot about Wise, the people who make displays, abandoning Linux and going to Windows because they were having driver problems. Oh. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, I read that. They'll just be out competed by somebody who wasn't dumb. Uh, <laughs> I'm not worried about a guess. Any comments on the uh, remarks from uh, Caldera today that they were saying that the. Uh, oh boy. <laughs> what was it? Next time I see Ransom, I'm going to slap him up the side of his silly head. That's my comment. What were the remarks? Yes, what were the remarks? He said Linux is a proprietary system because the GPL puts restrictions on what you can do. Oh, Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Ransom. Smoke a better drink. Smoke a better grade of drugs next time, please. <laughs> okay. Is the is the tape changed at this point? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Fine. I've been rolling for a long time. Okay. This seems like a good time. Uh, it's eight o'clock. I've only got another hour. I'm not sure I have time to do. I think maybe I'd, I'd, I'd better compress or, or, or lose the anthropology stuff because I'm not going to have time for both economics and advocacy. Well, can you G-zip with a dash 9? <laughs> what was that? G-zip with, with a dash 9. With a dash 9. Thank you, that wasn't helpful. <laughs> <laughs> we said G-zip with a dash 9. I said thank you, that wasn't helpful. Uh -huh. um, okay. Um, <coughs> Okay, let's 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 uh, make another fork in the decision tree here. Um, what do you want to hear about first? Economics or advocacy? The culture and anthropology. And economics. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, this is really unhelpful. Everyone has people who have the communication. Okay, uh, uh, anthropology? Okay. Economics and business models? Okay. Advocacy. Okay, it's, it's pretty much a dead heat between the anthropology and the advocacy people. So I guess I'll talk a little about anthropology and then go to advocacy. All right, anthropology. This is the material, uh, essentially it's a lot of the material in, um, in uh, Homestead and the Newosphere, together with some things I've learned since that bear on it. Um, and the anthropology part of the talk comes out of um, an observation that I made in my first paper about the way that we reward participation in the open source community. And uh, this is the third maximum of the bizarre style. The three are, are uh, uh, face outwards, not inwards, solicit input from everywhere, take code patches from strangers. Okay. Um, release early, release often to speed up the evolutionary tempo, and reward people with public praise, reward them with pure esteem. And this kind of makes sense because uh, there are really only, th classically, there are only three ways of motivating human beings, and two of them don't work on the internet. Um, <laughs> but one way that you can motivate people is uh, with coercion. Okay, you can force them to do things. It doesn't work very well in an internet context. It's it's really hard to hold a gun on somebody over a T1 line. The bandwidth just is <laughs> so coercion doesn't work very well. Uh, um, the second way you can motivate people is by handing them scarcity tokens, giving them wealth. That doesn't work very well on the internet either. The reason is less obvious. Um, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people look at this and think, well, people don't try to motivate open source developers with wealth because most people starting projects don't have a lot of wealth to rub together. Okay. While that is often true, it misses the real point, which is that it's very hard if some of your developers are in TNAC and others are in Sao Paulo, and others are in Vladivostok. It's very hard to set up an equitable payment system that's going to handle all of them. That's a sufficient complexity of process overhead that most people never think of trying. So scarcity tokens doesn't work very well either. 
And that leaves the third classical way to reward people, which is with social status, with peer esteem, with what I learned to call, you know, from science fiction fandom, to call ego goo. Okay. Uh, and I knew there was a, another story to be told here. I knew there was, there's, well, there was more to be found here. Uh, but I wasn't sure quite how to go about analyzing it because I was too close to the culture I was describing. It's a common problem for observer participant anthropologists. If you're a fish, you have trouble analyzing the water you're swimming in. <laughs> However, anthropologists have dealt with this problem before. It's a well-known issue in, in anthropological field work. And there are ways that you can, there are tricks you can use to get some analytical distance from the culture that you're analyzing. Um, and one of these, which I, I really picked up some nuances about from a book on uh, 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 field work on the study of Ayurvedic medicine in India, is look for a contradiction between the practice of the culture and what it says about its practice. Look for a contradiction between the way people behave and the, what they give as their reasoning for behaving. Um, and so I looked for a contradiction like that, and I found one. And the contradiction I found was this. If you look, to the extent that the open source culture has an explicit ideology at all, it's really defined by the classic open source licenses. The MIT license, the Berkeley license, the artistic license, and the new general public license. And the one thing all of these licenses have in common is that they make everybody equal in the evolutionary game. And according to these licenses, Anyone can hack anything at any time, and nobody else has the right to stop them. Now, if you think about it, this implies a much more chaotic development community than the one we actually live in. It suggests a world in which people routinely clone source bases, make whole-scale changes, changes in those source bases, and then redistribute them to all and sundry. Because after all, you've got the right to do that, right? You can do that at any time. But that's not actually the behavior we see. The behavior we see instead is that if I want to make a change in X windows, I don't copy the entire X window source base, make my change, and then redistribute Eric's version of X. No, we don't see that. Instead, what we see is when somebody wants to make a change to fetch mail, they will make a copy of fetch mail from my site, make their change, then generate a diff, and then send me a diff, and it's my decision whether that gets merged into the next mainline release. Okay? So with respect to live projects, there is a culturally recognized privileged role, the role of maintainer. And that maintainer has a kind of ownership of the project in that the maintainer has the exclusively recognized right to redistribute modified versions. Now, both of the qualifiers in that sentence are important. Custom does not recognize any limit on your right to redistribute unmodified copies of open source software. You can take X Windows or Fetch Mail or any of the other open source code bases out there and, uh, and, and, and put copies of them on a CD-ROM and distribute a million copies, and the authors won't kick and the community won't kick. No problem there. You could also take a copy of Fetch Mail or X Windows, modify it extensively for your own use, and nobody will object to that. The only way you get any pushback from the community is if you modify a program and redistribute it in competition with the maintenance group. That's called forking. We don't normally do that in this community. It's a heavily tabooed behavior. In fact, it's so tabooed that most people who have been around the culture for a while can list all of the major forks on the fingers of maybe one and a half hands. Okay. So this brings up an interesting question. Why is forking taboo? And the more general question is, what are the rules that regulate ownership of projects in this sense? And how and why are they culturally maintained? It turns out to be a big, interesting question. That's what we're going to explore now. Now, having observed that there is a privileged maintainer role in something like an ownership concept in the community, the next thing any good anthropologist will do is to attempt to elicit the rules by which ownership is acquired, maintained, and alienated. So the next question I ask myself is, what are the rules of project ownership? 
And I thought about it, and I did, I did not only have Linux experience to go on, I had my own experience in the open source culture going back to like 1980, and the experience of the whole internet culture going back to 1969. And as I looked at this history and thought about the stories I've heard and, and examined the behavior of people, it seemed to me that there were there are basically three rules about project ownership. Rule number one, if you found a project, you get to own it. That's not real complicated. Rule number two, if the previous maintainer of the project gives it to you, voluntarily transfers it to you, you own it. It will be significant uh, with respect to some of the things we we'll talk about later that for large important projects, uh, this transfer of ownership is typically a public act. It's something in which the community is seen to have a stake, not just the developers involved. The third way to acquire ownership of a project is the most interesting. You may at some point download a piece of source code from, uh, from an archive somewhere, and it meets your requirements, but you notice that, gee, there's a little bug that I can fix, or there's an enhancement that I can add. Um, and you'd like to get into the mainline next release, but you notice that um, you've got a problem. You can't reach the, the, the maintainers. They seem to have disappeared. They're gone. Okay. Custom, when this happens, custom permits you to poke your head out in a relevant topic group or a public news channel and say, uh, gee, does, has anybody heard from the maintainers of Project Clue lately? I just downloaded it and I added this switch or fixed this bug, and um, I'd like to get the change back to them. Is anybody else working on this project? And the kind of response you're looking for at this point is one of the following. You're looking for either one of the, the, the maintainers in, in the readme file or history list to pop up and say, oh yeah, we're, we're still here. We're going to put out another release soon, so send us your patch. Or the other response you'd be waiting for is for somebody to say, well, um, I'm not one of the project maintainers, uh, but you know, I've been working on this for a while, and I was just about ready to put out another release, and if you'll send me a patch, I'll roll into that release. If you don't get either of those responses, custom permits you to poke your head up in that channel again. Actually, you get style points for waiting longer. <laughs> you also get style points for announcing your intentions in more different channels, okay? giving people the maximum chance to respond. But if, if after a decent interval you don't get a response of, of this kind, custom permits you to poke your head up uh, in, in that channel again and say, well, the maintainers have disappeared, nobody else is interested in this project, I'll, I'll take it over now, you can send your patches to me. Okay? That kind of acquisition of ownership is subject to some challenge. If the original maintainers pop up before you've done a couple of releases and establish yourself as a responsible maintainer, they may be able to take it back from you. But the point is there comes a point at which you can legitimately say their claim is timed out, you put in enough effort, it's your project now. So, uh, so I, I, when I isolated these rules, I thought, wow, um, you know, I think I've seen rules like this before. This is not strange logic. Where have I seen this pattern? And then, aha, I got it. Any legal historians in the room? No, I didn't think so. <laughs> uh, we are talking about a system of rules here which is logically identical, a mathematician would say isomorphic, to the rules of land tenure under Anglo-American common law. <laughs> Now, that may seem like a kind of weird statement, so I'm going to back it up by describing <coughs> the three principles of the Lockean theory of property. That, that's obvious. You can go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it obvious to everybody? No. No. Would you call it squatter's rights? Um, squatter's rights correspond to the third way, the, the third way to acquire ownership of a project. Right. So, for the benefit of everybody else here, I'll, I'll give it up to you. The, um, the three ways to acquire ownership of land in common law are, uh, one, homesteading. Okay. When you homestead a piece of land, you go out to a frontier where there's a whole bunch of unowned land, you put a fence around the piece that you like, and you then defend the title. Okay. And defending title is very important in common law. It means that if somebody else comes and wants to fence off the same piece of land, you say to them, 
Um, hi there, here's my fence, here's my shotgun, have a nice day. <laughs> the second way to acquire ownership of a piece of land is by transfer of title. You go to someone who has a piece of land that you want, you offer them a sufficiently rich bundle of goods for that land so that they're willing to trade. And when you make a trade, they give you a, a deed, which is a, a transfer of title, which is actually the hither end of a chain of transfers of title, which ideally stretch back to one of the land's homestead. The third way to acquire ownership of a piece of land is by adverse possession, which is where you notice that there's a piece of land in the middle of a bunch of owned pieces of land. Uh, and, uh, and, and it looks like it should be owned, but nobody's there, and you can't locate the owners. Maybe the relatives all died and the courthouse burned down. Uh, and when you're in that situation, custom uh, co and the common law permit you to move onto that land and squat there, as the vernacular has it. And if you maintain, if you defend title for seven years in a day without having the, the owner you know, run up to you, your fence with a deed and say, hey, wait a second, this is my land and I've got a deed, you then, the, 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 the original owner's claim times out, and you acquire a property, you acquire a title to the property as though you had gotten a transfer of deed from the previous owner. Is that short enough for you? Okay. So, so it does seem, in fact, that we have a, a set of customs here which has evolved that is identical to the way land tenure is handled with common law. And once I realized this, I, I had to hold something big because it's not at all obvious why these two sets of rules should be the same. Well, maybe it's obvious to you. <laughs> but would you care to explain it? Ah, uh, well, it's um, so obvious. How do you explain it? Uh, <laughs> what, 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 the first rule is finders keepers. If I come across something and it doesn't belong to anybody, it belongs to me. Right. The second rule is I can give you what is mine. Yes. And in an open source community, that is more than giving you property. It's giving you a responsibility and a, a mantle. It, it's like uh, it, it lights uh, passing the mantle on to Elysium. Okay. Uh, the, the third one is kind of like the first one because it's abandoned property. Yeah. Uh, the isomorphism is, there it is. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, and there's a level at which that's a good explanation. What it doesn't explain is I'm going to think about this for about many seconds. Okay. <laughs> what it doesn't explain, which I now propose to go into, is why human beings have property systems of this kind in the first place, which helps us understand why these rules are held in common across widely different commodities. And once we come out the other side of that explanation, we'll be equipped to understand something basic about the open source culture. So bear with me. Well, isn't that just a Western culture thing you also? No. Because Indian, Native American Indians, even. Oh, you are so wrong! <laughs> <laughs> but I'm so glad you said that because I would have had to set up that myth myself in order to do that. <laughs> but it's not your fault that you're wrong, okay? <laughs> Don't laugh at this guy. It's not your fault. Um, in fact, you've been fooled by a romantic school of anthropology, which I will demolish shortly. Okay. Yes? It is probably important to point out that uh, for adverse possession, it's not necessary that the property be abandoned. It, it could be absolutely clear who owns it, but if you are in possession of it for 21 years. 21 years, instead of the seven year time out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, so we're going to address the general question of um, why human beings have property systems in the first place, and why there are no propertyless cultures, despite what you heard in anthropology class. <laughs> um, one of the unfortunate things about anthropology is that it's full of bullshit, and this is one of the bullshit pieces. <laughs> um, okay, why do human beings have property systems? Well, the key to understanding the answer to this question turns out to be, uh, turns out to lie in the answer to a, uh, to a, a the explanation of much simpler observation, which is that your dog knows where your property is. How many of you own dogs? Okay. You ever notice that when you move somewhere, your dog very rapidly acquires a representation of where your property line is, <laughs> even when that property line isn't marked and doesn't have an obvious fence or a creek or anything else. Okay. And you can tell that your dog has a representation of where your property line is because its behavior towards strangers is very different according to whether they're on one side or the other of that line. Okay? So your dog knows where your property is. Well, that's really interesting. And the reason that's interesting is because 
Dogs don't know about homesteading. They don't know about transfer of title. They don't know about adverse possession. Dogs, in fact, can't read. <laughs> they have no access to the whole elaborate system of symbology and, and social games that we use to regulate our behavior about, about property. And yet, there's some homology between human behavior about property and dog behavior about ter territoriality that is so exact and so powerful that even something as stupid as a dog can notice it. All right, so that suggests that in order to, explain, to, in order to answer the question, why do human beings have property systems, we can start by trying to answer the related question, why do dogs have territoriality? Now, this is good because now we have now reduced this question to one for which the answer is quite well known. And any evolutionary biologist will give you essentially the same story that you're about to hear from me now. And it goes something like this. Uh, let's consider the adaptive challenge facing a member of a predator species with no territorial behavior. There's a reason I specify uh, predator species. Because the thing about predators is that they need to have a certain range to hunt in. They need a certain amount of prey biomass to give them enough calories per day to survive. Same logic actually applies to large herbivores, but predators are, are more dramatic, so we'll use that analogy. Uh, so let's say you are a wolfoid without territorial behavior, and you're a member of a species where there are a whole bunch of wolfoids wandering across the landscape and, and competing for the same resources, and occasionally two wolfoids will bump into each other. And when they bump into each other, they're going to fight because they're competing for the same resources. It's a zero-sum game. Now, the problem with fighting, if you're, if you're a pair of wolfoids, is that both the winner and the loser are likely to end up badly injured. One of them may well end up dead. Both winner and loser are likely to end up badly injured, which is a serious problem because if you're a wolfoid, you don't have hospitals and sterile bandages and clean water, and you're very likely to get an infection and die. So, 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 so fighting, uh, fighting competitively may be, um, in some sense, an optimal strategy, but it's still a very risky one. Okay? So, there's pressure on all the genetic lines in the species, selective pressure, to develop behaviors which permit them to negotiate their way out of having to fight so often. There's a premium on behaviors which reduce interspecies violence. And over and over again, when this adaptive challenge comes up in the animal kingdom, we see the same solution uh, evolving in, in, in like different phyletic lines. And the solution is called territoriality. It's a simple set of rules that goes like this. Uh, I'm a wolf, okay? I sit in the middle of my territory. I'm over on this site. There's nobody sitting over there. Um, <laughs> and I need space to demonstrate this. Uh, um, I'm a wolf. I'm sitting in the middle of a territory. I now, I now put markers all around my territory <laughs> that other wolves can smell. <laughs> okay? And the rules of the territoriality game are very simple. If you cross a wide set of markers that you can smell, you know that there's a wolf inside that territory, and it's probably going to fight harder than you will to kick you out, so you better cease and desist or die, unless, uh, or take a, a large risk of dying, especially um, because the wolf is in its territory, it's not going to retreat, so it's going to fight harder, um, and you're probably going to lose, unless you know that you are young and strong and that wolf is old and weak and about ready to die anyway, at which point its contribution isn't genetically important anymore, so the instincts that evolve don't hedge against that possibility. Okay. And we can observe both from, from game theoretical arguments and from actual figures, actual empirical observation of levels of violence in territorial and non-territorial species, that territoriality is a very effective way to reduce the level of interspecies violence in a population of fierce predators. Okay. Now, but there's another point here. Why do wolves defend Territory. Well, we know the answer to this. They need a certain amount of protein per day to survive. So, territory is defended by wolves precisely because the benefits from defending that territory exceed the risk and energy cost of defending it. Important observation because you see this applies to human cultures as well. That's a pattern that you see globally. Human cultures will treat as property precisely those resources for which the cost of defending them is less than the benefits from controlling the goods that that territory yields. 
Um, and in fact, it's true that Plains American Indians and Kalagadi Bush people do not assert uh, land tenure over large random patches of desert. There's a reason they don't assert land tenure over large random patches of desert. Because they're desert. It's because large random patches of desert are worthless. Okay? And as a check on this theory, we observe that these Kungsan Bush people, who don't assert land tenure over large random patches of deserts, do assert land tenure with a Lockean set of rules, it's not just a Western thing, over another kind of real estate. You ready for this? Water holes. Okay? And what makes the difference? Okay? The difference is that water holes do have a reliable yield of a critical survival good, and they're small, and they're compact, and they're easy to defend. So the answer is, every culture has property systems exactly when it's worth it. Exactly when it's worth it to assert property. And, that's an, and worth it is a very hard test. Does it cost you more to assert and defend the property right than the benefit you get from controlling it? So this is a really important observation, coming back to, to uh, open source behavior, because it tells us that if hackers are, are um, spending a lot of time and energy maintaining elaborate ownership customs, keeping history lists, enforcing a taboo against forking, so forth and so on, then we know that they must be defending some critical good that is sufficiently valuable to justify all the effort put into maintaining these customs. Right? That's an important observation. What is this good? Well, we already know the answer to that question. It's reputation within the culture itself. But what our excursion through, through biology highlights is the fact that that good must be pretty damn important or people wouldn't bother defending it. So the next question is, why is reputation within the culture of open source developers a valued good? Why is it valuable enough to justify all this effort? And there are a couple. And there are answers to that on a couple different levels. Um, one answer is reputation can have spillover effects in the scarcity economy that surrounds the hacker culture. Okay? If you have your name on a major piece of open source software, it looks really good on your resume. You're likely to be able to get a better job. Okay? You might get a book contract out of it. You might have a bunch of strangers fly you to Boston to give them a lecture and take them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You might even get 51,000 shares of the Linux stock. Uh, and the stock price is actually rising again, so. <laughs> source peers can actually matter because, and the reason is that, is that in the wider culture, outside the open source culture, people tend to use other people's judgments as a proxy for how they should evaluate a person's work. So even if people aren't open source hackers, they will sometimes use the judgments of open source hackers as a proxy in a valuable context. Um, a second reason that reputation is important is because it's instrumentally useful within the culture itself. And to see this, consider a situation where two projects start up simultaneously in an application area that you are fascinated by. Okay. One of these projects is run by Linus Torvalds. The other project is run by somebody you've never heard of. Which project are you going to join and contribute to? Okay. So reputation is instrumentally useful within the culture because it gives you a way to recruit people's participation to help you do your stuff. A third way in which reputation is useful is that from the point of view of the whole culture, it tends to direct work where it's most needed. That is, you get more social reward for doing work that's interesting and difficult and lots of people need than work that's sort of trivial and very few people are interested in it. So the reputation game is sort of efficiency maximizing. Can we say that the open source culture evolved a reputation game because it's efficiency maximizing? Probably not. Species and cultures don't have intentions and they don't try to optimize themselves. But the moment you realize that cultural machines <coughs> compete with each other, as well as individuals competing with each other, the picture changes because then you can have a picture 
um, like several different open source cultures to, 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 carried by different groups of people with competing value systems. And if one of them has a reputation game metric and the others don't, it's going to tend to operate more efficiently and efficiently and outcompete and eventually displace the others. So in a context of evolution and competition, the reputation game is favored because it promotes efficiency. But these are all fairly superficial reasons. I believe uh, that the real reason that, um, that we have a, a reputation game in the hacker culture is because human beings are wired that way. We are all deeply wired to play social status games. And why is this? Now we have to go into biology a bit for a moment before we can understand what this all means. Not to attract women. Human beings are deeply wired to play social status games because we have spent most of our evolutionary history not in cities and wearing clothes and, and, you know, and using writing and, and hacking computers. We spent most of our species history running around <coughs> naked in nomadic bands on the Pleistocene savannah before we had any technological multipliers. We didn't have tools other than maybe the crudest stone things. We didn't have fire. We didn't have cities. We didn't have uh, technological multipliers of any significance. And in that situation, the access of any individual adult member to resources in the environment is going to be about equal to any other adult members. Okay? You really can't get much of an edge over your fellows by, through technology if you don't have technology or through, uh, um, or through having more wealth if there's no more wealth than what individuals can carry. Um, so instead, we, we, we became wired to, um, to, to, complete, to compete for the skills and abilities and, if you like, charisma that would aid us in forming social coalitions to induce other people to do what we want. So the winners in that selective game are the people who accumulate social status, that is, the ability to induce other people to do what they want. So we're descended from people who were selected from that. Once you realize that, we can sort, sort of sort human cultures into a couple different bins according to the kinds of status games that they play. And when you do this, you come up with three basic status games, which correspond to the three kinds of possible reward that I mentioned earlier. The first kind of status game is a command hierarchy. In a command hierarchy, you gain status by having the biggest club or being able to command people with the biggest club. Um, status essentially equals coercive power or arises out of coercive power. Uh, this is the kind of this is the kind of, of status game that you see in the most primitive and smallest scale human organizations. And the reason for that is that status, uh, is the command hierarchies don't scale very well. And the reason they don't scale very well is, because the, same, uh, is the same n squared complexity explosion that we looked at earlier. Um, as if, if all the resource allocation is going through one big guy in the middle or one clique in the middle, uh, that clique, it, it's not sufficient for them to keep track uh, to, to monitor all the people in the society. They have to monitor all the communications paths as well. This is a familiar problem. The difficulty of that problem goes up with the square of the number of people in the social unit. And at about 250 people, the maximum size of a Neolithic village it becomes unmanageable. So you don't see pure command hierarchies that are larger than that typically. Uh, so because that doesn't scale very well, human beings evolve a second kind of status game, which I call an exchange economy. In this status game, you gain status by having control of things to use or trade, and status becomes driven by wealth. This is the game that we learned to play when we started building cities. Right? Um, and um, the exchange economy status game scales really well. We can scale up to the size of an entire planetary economy, and we have, in fact, done so. Um, and they imply different kinds of behavior. The characteristic behavior of the command hierarchy is warfare. The characteristic behavior of the exchange economy is trade, simple to barter, the free market. Now, once you present people with these metaphors and ask, you know, what societies and what parts of society are, 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 are framed on these status games, they can start having uh, 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 intuitions about them pretty quickly. For example, it's immediately clear that we live in what is general, a, a generally a huge exchange society, uh, exchange economy, with sort of floating enclaves of para, uh, uh, floating parasitic enclaves of command hierarchy behavior floating in it and sustained by the larger system. 
Those floating enclaves include, for example, um, organized crime and governments. <laughs> <laughs> but I repeat myself. <laughs> um, what most people don't realize, unless they've taken a, at least a few anthro classes, is that there's actually a third kind of status game that human beings are wired to play. And this is the status game that we have learned to play in situations where we don't have serious scarcity constraints. Uh, both the command hierarchy and the exchange economy are basically ways of solving scarcity problems in addition to being status, uh, uh, status games. But we can ask the question, what kind of game do human beings play when they're not constrained by scarcities of critical survival goods? In other words, what kind of status game do you develop if you are, for example, a Kwakiutl or Haida Indian living in the Pacific Northwest? And, well, um, it's a mild climate, so you're not worried about shelter. There's um, nuts falling out of the trees, salmon swimming up the streams, uh, the streams, deer running through the woods, edible plants all over the place. You're not worried about food. And population density is low, so if anybody waves a club at you, you can go away. Party! Yeah. <laughs> okay. What you develop is what anthropologists call a gift culture, in which you claim and gain status by giving stuff away. <laughs> Let's bring this a little closer to home. Let's say that you are a Getty, or a Forbes, or the Sultan of Brunei. <laughs> all, you and all your buddies already have 13 gold-plated Learjets. <laughs> your buddies by buying a 14th. You just about burned out the exchange economy scarcity token accumulation game. So how do you compete for status with your peers? You throw elaborate parties. You perform public acts of philanthropy. You engage in conspicuous display behavior that basically says, look how cool and powerful I am. Look how much stuff I can give away. Or, here's another case. You see a whole bunch of people slaving over hot consoles for days and weeks at a time to build elaborate, intangible artifacts, which they then give away for a status reward. Wow, we're a gift culture. Okay? That's an important thing to understand. That's really the punchline of, of, of the anthropology stuff, which is, again, this is not a novel, weird, radical, bizarre pattern. Okay? Gift cultures are what human beings do when they're not constrained by scarcity economics anymore. This leads to some interesting predictions. One prediction is that as the average wealth level rises, more and more people will join our gift culture because they'll want to. When human beings form gift cultures around their arts and their sciences whenever they get a chance to, they just do that. It's like a tropism built into the brain. So that's a good reason for believing that our culture will continue to grow. Uh, and that leads naturally to the next question, which is how do you mate a gift culture with a market culture in such a way that they're both happy? Which is the more general case of the question, how do you make money from open source? And what, first I should, I should um, address the meta question, which is, why do you care, as if you're operating inside the scarcity economy, if you're a business person who wants to increase shareholder value and make money, then why do you care about working with a gift culture? Why don't you do everything in the exchange mode? And the answer is this. Um, historical experience basically shows us that exchange um, economies are much better than command hierarchies at solving material scarcity problems. They make people richer, they make people freer. Markets work, they're cool. Okay? What, however, what experience also shows us is that in the production of complex creative work, gift cultures have a substantial edge over markets. Passion gives you better work than wages. Communities of passionate people give you better creative work than communities of people working for money. And that's why, as a business per person working inside the exchange economy, you still care a whole lot about how to make an interface with a gift culture work. 
because if you can turn that trick, it will make you lots of scarcity tokens. <laughs> we'll outcompete people who are playing only by scarcity rules. Okay, so uh, at this point, I would normally launch into my whole economics thing, uh, but we've only got about 20 minutes left, uh, theoretically, and uh, I, I saw a lot of call for advocacy, so I guess I should start talking about that now. Before I do that, questions about anthropology? Yeah, in, in both uh, Homestay and the News Fair, what you just talked about, you listed the circumstances in which I can claim an area either because it's, it's new, it's been given to me, or no one else seems to be doing it. Yeah. But there are circumstances both under the Lockean theory of government and free economies in which I can forcibly take someone else's property because it's in the interest of society as a whole. We have no equivalent of that in the hacker culture. Okay. But and if we ever get one, I will defect. Well, here, here's an example. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to use an example from Microsoft, but it's the only one that comes to mind. You have someone who builds some type of mail system. Yeah. Someone else builds a calendar system. One day someone comes along and says, why don't I build some Microsoft Office type of, type of product that combines the two, that makes it into a single product that, that works these together because you get a huge benefit. There's Rather no compulsion than, here. What's that? There's no compulsion here. The person who does that don't, doesn't take away anybody else's rights into two existing pieces of code. But you merge into a different product in which you no longer have the leaders of the two projects are no longer leading the new one. But if the original code is open source, it's still out there. Nobody's rights have been abrogated. But you're no longer getting all your 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 benefits, your ego boost gone because yours is no longer the product to use. It's now just a smaller piece of a larger product. You go from being the CEO of your company to just being some vice president. I don't understand the relevance of this scenario. Can we do this in our culture? It, it seems like in economics there's a benefit to doing it, but our culture, when you forcibly take someone else's property, the rest of the culture seems to ostracize that person, yeah. and therefore we'd never get the circumstance of a hostile takeover, even if in, in kind of economic senses it makes sense for the community as a whole to do so. I think at that point we sued Microsoft for uh, violating the um, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I don't, under, I don't understand the question. Right. Yeah, that kind of fork is, the fork, <coughs> the fork, as I said before, the forks are very rare because people get flayed for perpetrating. But, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I, 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 I don't understand your question. Oh, no, no, I want to take up more time from the rest of your lecture. But, you know, <coughs> your model of the gift culture doesn't work for composers like Mozart or other famous composers who are wonderful artists, but who all work for money. Or were getting paid for, them, for what they did. And, uh, As performers. They were sponsored by rich people who sponsored them so that they could give their gifts to the world. That's right. That's true. They did it because they wanted to give gifts, and it just happened. That's right. And as a musician myself, I'll tell you that any musician who is only doing it for the money ain't worth a damn as a musician. Okay. Um, musicians may, uh, may, musicians may in fact alter their behavior into making more money sometimes, but. And so they can make more money, but fundamentally they're always doing it for the audiences and for their standing with other musicians. It's a pretty close analogy to the way programming works. Uh, yeah, uh, Perhaps I can flip this question around and also pivot into advocacy here. Uh, I might have a situation where rather than looking at a small bug face, I can look at some code and see that it really deserves some re-architecting. Yeah. And all I have to give is my little piece of ego. Maybe I can convince a few other people that they feel the same way and they would give theirs. But how do we get some major architectural overhaul to happen when it's needed? Oh, um, usually somebody looks at an existing um, <coughs> existing code with better with better architecture and says, I can do better than build something else from scratch. So what about the rest of us who look at it and say, I can't do better, but I can see that 
it, something better needs to be done. Uh, well, maybe you make noise in a relevant news group, and that helps stimulate somebody to act. But if you've been around this culture for a while, you realize, you'll, you, you'll notice that we don't tend to spend a lot of time trying to patch designs that are broken or extend legacy systems. We're much more likely to just dynamite the start of the uh, Yeah? Um, couldn't the whole open source system break down if the small subset of the community thought it's disproportionately from the rest? Well, we have so far. But it's fairly uh, new, it's happening now. Uh, I mean, you know, somebody like Red Hat, you, know, it's, you, you get thousands of people contributing code, and you got a small handful of people getting fabulously rich off of their efforts. At some point, aren't those people going to be a little dysfunctional? Well, it depends on whether they were doing it for the money or not. Um, and the reason I don't think this is a serious risk is because Demand for programmers has been really, really heavy for 20 years now. And that means that I think anybody who could be seriously upset, uh, motivated by money or upset by other people making money, <coughs> has already gone elsewhere. They've already been selected out of our culture. But uh, aren't there a fair amount of people that uh, work both in the open source and have you know, regular paying jobs? And yeah. That's sort of the standard. So I mean, they're, they're not driven solely by open Right. But their contribution to the open source community is driven by that passion, by the, by the gift of all Japan. But it doesn't necessarily need a bad taste in their mouth when they see that other people are profiting in a literal financial Okay. You aren't from inside this culture, so I'll say a little something from, by the question you're asking. So I will say a little something like that. And if I'm wrong, those of you who, like me, are from inside this culture can, can object. Most open source developers do not have an intrinsic problem with other people profiting from their work. There is something they do have an intrinsic problem with, which is other people profiting from their work in a way they're not allowed to. So it's okay, from my point of view as an open source uh, developer, if I write a piece of code like Fetchmail and I give it away, and Fetchmail sells that as part of a product that makes them a lot of money. That's okay with me. The only thing that would bother me is if Fetchmail asserted a right to profit from that software and denied me my right to do so. Try to close off access to that. Is that a fair statement for the rest of yeah, the Yeah, the, the community was much more upset about Sun posting the Blackdown Java software than they were about the Red Hat guys making money. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Is, it, it, is, that a, is that a responsive answer? Well, if uh, people are still happy to have yeah. a solution, sure. So, so the answer is fundamentally on that level, we don't really care. What we care about isn't the money, it's power asymmetries. What's it is very clear is Red Hat is not profiting from that code, but from something else. Right, they're using that code as an on trade build service and branding um, uh, business. And that's okay, we don't have a problem with that. In fact, that's good because it advances the sinister plan for world knowledge. <laughs> 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 a lot of the business people who think they're using us don't realize that we're using them. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, could you discuss Sun's uh, error or crime? Sun's what? Error, error or crime, whatever Sun did, which was oh, offensive. Yeah. I don't know about it. Oh. What Sun did was they promulgated a license called the Sun uh, Community Source License, which if you don't look at it too hard, it looks like it might be an open source license. But in fact, if you read the fine print, you discover that Sun retains proprietary and exclusive control of all of your contributions. And that's exactly the situation that pisses open source developers off. Because it's camouflaged? I mean, otherwise you just ignore it. The fact that it's camouflaged makes it more offensive. If it was obvious, it would be offensive. The fact that there's been a, a, an incompetent attempt to camu camouflage it makes it really offensive. I thought it was pretty obvious. Yeah. How does that relate to Mozilla? Mozilla is under the under an open source license, so I mean, we don't see it. Yeah. It's very good. I think the reference was to Sun's release of the, the Java project that wasn't really their project, but they seem to take credit. Oh, yo, that, that pissed people off a lot. That pissed, 
That pissed people off more than Son's prophets on the I didn't hear what he said. He said the issue here was uh, Son essentially issuing code produced by the Blackdown Project, an open source Java project, and essentially taking credit for it and not allowing the, the Blackdown people any kudos. That pissed off the open source community a lot worse than the amount of money that was at stake. Yeah. Okay, so we're talking about um, having a product or reading some code and then resubmitting it to a maintainer in the hopes that the maintainer will recognize that, hey, yeah, this is an improvement. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the end goal is the, the code is better and it's circulating. Yeah. Uh, what do you do when you come across a fickle maintainer who, for whatever reason, goes, no, this really is fine, your changes are not necessary? You have two alternatives. You can suffer, which is what most people do, or you can attempt to force the project. The force the project. That's very unusual. Okay. Um, and um, the reason it's unusual comes out of this um, uh, comes out of this gift culture analysis and the reputation scoring scoreboarding. We can't permit forking because it dilutes reputation incentives. It exposes people on both sides of the fourth of, of the fort to a reputation risk that they can't control, namely the, the side of the fort they're not associated with. So that's one of the bases of the taboo. There are others. Yeah, there's a, a third way. If you look in the Linux kernel, there are patches which are unofficial patches that Linux has officially approved but yet are out there if you want to do something like Yeah, like Richard Gooch's DevFS patch, which went with like 243 iterations before it actually made it into the kernel. So people do sometimes maintain patches in parallel with the main line of the project. So um, yeah, we really got to have. A, I got really got to start talking about advocacy if we're going to do that any kind of justice at all. Can we pause for a sec? Oh yeah, I've been thinking about it for a while. Uh, you're saying you're claiming that there are sometimes good technical integration reasons for what would amount to a hostile takeover, but we don't do them because we want to preserve um, project identity. Exactly. We do have an answer to that question. Um, the answer to that question is, go ahead and merge the code, just don't take anyone's name off the history list. Are there any examples of that having happened in the past? But, but it might be more effort to do so that way. I, I have to I have to take the, the two existing structures and build a complete bridge between them. And then the whole time as their architectures are, as they're adding new things, I have to maintain this bridge between them. Yeah. Whereas it'd be nice if I could just merge the two architectures into a third. Life is hard. <laughs> um, typically, you're going to have the same problem with any two closed source um, um, projects developed inside an organization. And often, you're going to have a much worse project because, oddly enough, although open source programmers who are territorial in the way I've described. We have a cultural basic that you don't let your territoriality get in the way of good work. Closed source programmers often don't have that fix. So you're actually, this is a problem that's really orthogonal to open source. And you're actually likely to have it worse than a closed source shop. At least that's what my experience of shops like that says. Uh, okay, advocacy. Um, all right, the background, this is, uh, there are actually more people here who like, don't know about my history than I expected, uh, which kind of changes the presentation I give. Um, so for those of you who like, don't know who I am or have just heard of me as a sort of generic famous name with whites around it, <laughs> um, I, I guess I, I need to give a brief explanation of, of how I ended up here. <laughs> <laughs> What's it? Providing a double ego booth for life. Oh, well, I'm just trying to deal with reality, okay? <laughs> um, all right. Um, the reason that I'm, I'm here today, the reason I've become like this famous person who gets flown around to give talks, uh, it's not actually because I wanted this to happen. I don't have to like, believe me on this. Um, I would have been just as happy to like sit at home and write code for the rest of the time. Uh, but after I wrote the cathedral in the bazaar, uh, it had um, an effect that I anticipated and an effect that I didn't anticipate. The 
effect that I anticipated was that it completely changed the language and the sort of generative myth that the hacker culture used to describe its own behavior. <coughs> this was not a surprising result because one of the things I had observed is that um, we had this really effective development method that was also almost completely unconscious. People learned it by osmosis, but they didn't reason about it or reflect on it. Okay? And I knew from previous examples that dramatic things tend to happen when you make culture conscious of its own effective behavior. Okay? When you give people language to describe what they've been doing all along anyway, it sort of creates this discontinuity in, conscious, in consciousness, and suddenly people are a, a lot more intense and usually happier about what they're doing. Because now they don't just have a set of shared values that have a sort of identity that they didn't have before. So it wasn't surprising to me when lots of people adopted the bizarre label as a label for the development practice. Um, I thought that that was about the only thing that would happen, that the, that the paper would essentially only be of interest to people inside the hacker culture. It would sort of bootstrap them up to a level of consciousness about what they were doing. That would be a happy result. Everybody wins. Okay. The result I didn't expect, and was in fact quite astonished by, was that it turned out that there were people outside the hacker culture, people wearing suits, <laughs> who also understood what I was driving at. And the first time that I knew that this was an issue was uh, when I was sitting at my machine in, uh, in late January 1998, and I got an email from somebody who said, uh, Eric, um, I think you better go look at this particular URL here, because I think somebody's been reading your paper. And I fired up a browser, chased the URL, and found myself looking at, at Netscape's original press release announcing that they were going to be open sourcing what later became the Mozilla browser. And I read through this press release, and my jaw went, <laughs> because as I read the press release, there were large portions of it that seemed strangely familiar. <laughs> <laughs> as though somebody had taken the language in my paper and run it through the marketing meat grinder. <laughs> so I popped back to my mailer window and sent back the guy, the guy back a reply that said, uh, yeah, it looks like somebody's been reading the Cathedral of the Bazaar. I think I'm going to call Netscape and find out what's going on here. So I did that. I called Netscape's main number. <laughs> and I, I, ex I explained to the nice receptionist what I was trying to find out. And that started me off on about a 15-minute bureaucratic phone maze, which eventually ended up at the, vo at the voice box of someone who I thought, uh, voicemail box of somebody who I thought might be the appropriate human being. And I left that person a message that basically went like, uh, 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 did I have something to do with this? <laughs> and if I did, would somebody please tell me? <laughs> and I hung up the phone. And within an hour, I got a call from a very nice woman named Roseanne Sino, who was a publicity honcho at Netscape at the time. And she gave me a 20 minute spiel, which boiled down to, uh, yes, Mr. Raymond, you had something to do with this. All of our top guys read your paper and they loved it. And I'm going to go to the world. And, uh, and, um, and Jim Marksdale, our CEO, is out giving your name to the national press explaining why we did this. And I'm going to go to the And by the way, I think Jim Marksdale wants to talk with you. And I'm going, no. people, my, my friends, 
my coworkers, my colleagues, people in the Unix culture, people in the open source culture. I watched the, the, some of the most brilliant people in the world repeatedly come up with wonderful architectures, lovely dreams, better ways to do things, things that really would have made a positive difference to the world. And I watched those people most of the time repeatedly get the shit kicked out of them by morons with good marketing. And you know what? After 20 years of that, watching that kind of thing happen, you get really fucking tired. You get really fed up. And the reaction I had to what to the flat that was building around the cathedral and the bazaar and the whole open source thing, we hadn't named it that, that yet. We called it free software then. Yeah. Was maybe it's finally time to turn things over. Maybe this time the good guys get to me. But the other thing that I saw was I saw a couple of futures way out in front of me. There was one future. Um, the, the, the thing that I was terrified by was the prospect that Netscape might do what it was doing, open source the code, and then fail. And then for the next 15 years, anybody who went into a, a, a corporate office and said, you know, you really ought to like, get clued in about this free software thing. The response they get would be, Netscape tried that in a tank. Go away, kid, you bothered me. I didn't want that to happen, so I discovered that I had a real strong interest in helping Netscape succeed at what it was doing. I saw another possible future, and in that possible future, Netscape succeeded. It, it achieved its strategic objectives by open sourcing that code. But the behavior came to be seen as a sort of weird, one-off fluke a strategy that nobody had any interest in, in duplicating or trying to repeat. And I thought that what might make the difference between that future and the future I wanted to live in, in which open source became a routine development method and the software quality problem got a good big whack, I thought what might make the difference is if there was somebody out there, independent of Netscape, telling a credible story about why they did what they did and why other corporations might want to consider doing the same thing. And so I thought really hard about what it would take to do effective advocacy. And it began to dawn on me that we hadn't been doing effective advocacy because if we had, it wouldn't have taken us 20 bloody years to come out of the wilderness, and we wouldn't have needed a corporate CEO to make the first break. So I thought really seriously about advocacy, and I began to come to some conclusions about it. And in those three or four hours, I developed a pretty complete strategy for spreading what I still labeled a free software idea that I thought would be effective. And I've been executing that strategy ever since for a little more than two years now. I think I can safely claim that it's been at least moderately successful. <laughs> so because I believe that it's been successful, I'm going to tell you what I did and why I did it so you can go out there and do this and make it work even better. Uh, one of the first things I realized was that we, had the, we have a traditional advocacy strategy in the Unix world, in the open source world, that is exactly backwards. It's perverse. It's wrong. It doesn't work. I'll describe this strategy now. Some of you will recognize it because some of you have tried to do it. How I tried to do it. The traditional Unix advocacy strategy looks something like this. You, as an engineer, get really excited about some wonderful new piece of technology or some method, some GCC or GDB or, or, or the web or something like that. And you get, you get all excited about it, and you go back to where you were, and you get all your peer engineers really excited about it, 
And your theory is that if the engineers get ex sufficiently excited about it, they will go to their first line managers and they will spread the good word and the first line managers will get really excited about it and they'll become zealots too. And then they'll go to their second line managers and the second line managers will get all excited about it and so forth and so on. So, and if you do this well enough, enlightenment will trickle up the organization <laughs> until it reaches the strategists at the top who will slap their foreheads and say, wow, we were totally wrong about our IT strategy, but now that you, the lowly engineers, have enlightened us, we'll change all of our business practices next week. <laughs> now, when I put it that way, it doesn't sound like it should work very well, does it? <laughs> but that's about the only advocacy strategy we had for 20 years. Actually, that's not true. We had one other advocacy strategy, which consisted of Richard Stallman walking into a corporate CIO's office and saying, Hi there, Mr. CIO. You should use all free software because property is theft and reporting is bad and sharing is good. <laughs> um, that didn't work very well either. Okay. So, but I realized that maybe we could be forgiven for the fact that our advocacy strategy was completely incompetent because we had never seen what a successful advocacy case looked like. And that is a way in which the Netscape breakthrough made a difference. Because for the first time, we have an example of a whole corporation, a technology bellwether, the darling of the Fortune 500, finally saying, wow, maybe those scruffy hackers got something right. And how did it happen? It didn't happen bottom up. It didn't happen because engineers drove the process and convinced their bosses. It happened because one guy at the top of the corporation had a moment of enlightenment and then imposed that vision on everybody beneath him. And this is why I say the traditional advocacy strategy is exactly backwards. Now I'll tell you why it's backwards. Because all pyramidal organizations, all authority hierarchies, are composed of three layers of people. There's the people at the bottom who can do stuff. There's the people at the top who can steer the organization and set policy. And there's a layer in the middle whose job is essentially to act as conservators of the organization, to provide stability. Because that's the case, because the middle manager's job is to maintain the stability of the organization, not to set policy. When you get to the middle management level with your technology excitement and you say, we should really be doing this, and the manager says, no, it's not interesting, or no, it's, not, it's too big a risk, the manager is not being evil and not being stupid. He's doing his job. That's what he's supposed to do. The only people, and trying to go upwards in the organization through that impermeable conservator layer is a doomed strategy. It's like beating your head against a brick wall. It only feels good when you stop. <laughs> it's, in, it's, in, it's in the nature of, of, of authority hierarchies that that's never going to work. So the, the enlightenment that I had at that point was, gee, if we're going to succeed, if we're going to change the business practices of these corporations, then we got to stop trying to beat our heads against that middle management wall. We got to go straight for the people at the top who have the charter and the authority to make genuine changes in the direction of the organization. Okay, that's easy to say, but it's a little harder to do. I mean, we don't have Jim Barksdale's having spontaneous enlightenments every day. It took an awfully long time. And most of us don't play golf with Jack Welch. Okay? It's one of the realities of the situation. Most of us don't have day-to-day -day contact with Fortune 500 CEOs. So given that that's the case, given we don't have day-to-day um, -day contact with these people, how do we slip our LSD into their conceptual waters? <laughs> that I came up with was that it, this means that we need to have a media-centered strategy. 
If we can't reach these, these, these strategic deciders directly, then we need to capture the media from which they form their opinions. We need to capture the media that they get their information from. And we need to saturate that media with pro-free software memes so that the smart ones are saying, wow, this is where the future is. I want to get there first. And the dumb ones are saying, everybody else is doing it. I better do it too. <laughs> OK, so media-centered strategy, but that has some other implications. Uh, one of the implications of a media-centered strategy is we need an evangelist. Why is that? Well, it's a fact about the media that they don't buy stories about novel abstract ideas. Why don't they buy stories about novel abstract ideas? It's because most of the people on the planet and most of the people who read business magazines aren't wired like those of us in this room. Okay? Most of us here are what in the Myers-Briggs typology are called intuitive thinkers. We're comfortable with abstractions. We're comfortable with relatively, um, relatively elaborate logical arguments. We have long attention spans for that kind of thing. Most people don't. And the people who run the media know that. They know that what they need to do to attract people's attention is tell dramatic stories about people in conflict. They need to present charismatic faces. So if we're going to work that media, we need charismatic faces. We need heroes. We need public figures that are speaking a language that the readers of that media can understand. So how do we go about developing that? So I, I said to myself, OK, what are the characteristics of a successful evangelist? What does that person need to, to be and do? Well, a person needs to be an effective writer and speaker. A uh, person needs to have some experience of dealing with the press. A person needs to be uh, fairly financially secure because at least for the near term, this job ain't going to pay. A person needs to be an extrovert. That's the point at which I went, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> because you see, um, as much as I love my tribe, we don't produce a whole lot of extroverts. <laughs> um, and that's the point at which I realized that I was basically filling out a job description for myself and was doomed to become a public figure for a while. Um, not that there aren't other people who could do the job, but like they weren't on the spot and I was. Okay, I had this. I had this, this sort of this, this, this option to go public, you know, consequent on the media flap about the cathedral and the bazaar, and nobody else was really positioned to do that at the time. So, so the question I asked myself at that point was, you know, am I willing to do this? Am I willing to basically give up having a private life and travel a whole lot and become a public person, which is not something I essentially like doing more than writing code, okay? Am I willing to do all this so that we can stop losing and actually win around? And am I willing to like try and train other evangelists as well? So eventually I can retire and go back to writing code. <laughs> well, I decided I was willing to do that, and that's why I'm here. A first important step in built in in the uh, in the propaganda campaign, the sinister master plan for world domination. One of the critical steps was when I realized that it wasn't just a matter of not having had evangelists do a decent strategy. We also had a fundamental problem because our language was all wrong. And as a, as a good example of this, let's consider the connotations of the term free software. If you say free software to the average corporate executive, if you're lucky, okay, remember, we're talking about 1998. The situation's a little different now. Not enough different to make a difference. But back in 1998, if you said to a corporate executive, free software, if you were lucky, the reaction you'd get is, hmm, free, you must be cheap, shoddy, worthless, you lose. If you were not lucky, the reaction you would get would sound like this, free software. Doesn't that have something to do with that long-haired communist in Boston? <laughs> <laughs> now, for purposes of this discussion, it is irrelevant that Richard Stallman was not actually a communist. <laughs> <laughs> the point 
point is that the whole sort of idealistic, moralistic, sharing is good, intellectual property is bad, therefore you should join my religious crusade. It, it's, that's not really neutral to corporate executive types. It's actively poisonous. Okay? You cannot win with a pitch like that. Notice that I'm saying nothing about whether it's a right pitch or a wrong pitch. I'm making no claims about the ethics of the situation. I'm saying that as a piece of marketing, as a piece of public relations, it don't fly. Okay? We needed a better approach. We needed an approach which spoke language that business people could understand. And why do I focus on business people, by the way? The reason I focus on business people here, and especially the Fortune 500, is because the Fortune 500 is the largest concentrated market for software. And it follows that if you want to change the demand on software producers so they start opening um, uh, open sourcing stuff, you need to change the demand that their largest single market are making on them. If the, uh, my, my deduction was that if the Fortune 500 started routinely saying, we want open source for you or we're not going to be able to trust your software and we're not going to buy it, we win. Until the Fortune 500 says that, we ain't won yet. Okay? So I was focusing on what persuades business people, and that meant that we needed to learn how to speak language that would at least not scare and turn them off. Okay? And ideally, we would need to learn to make a positive pitch in terms like, your profits will go up. Your risks will go down. Your shareholder value will, ex will, will increase. Your genitals will get larger. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You'll look really good on the next quarterly report, which is sort of the business equivalent of your genitals getting larger. <laughs> um, uh, so <laughs> we needed to work out language that would make that kind of positive pitch. And the first critical step in that campaign was finding a better replacement for the term free software. Okay? That's not just a sort of weird neutral change of labels. Instead, it, it's, it's a shift from expressing an attitude that business people are turned off by and can't live with to an attitude that sounds friendly and cruel to them and they can live with. So we actually, I mean, when I went out to consult with Netscape, in, uh, in, I guess it was in, yeah, it was in early February, no, it was in early March. Um, I actually had a meeting with a bunch of people in the area, Bay Area Linux community, and we, we sat at that table and we brainstormed possible terms for the thing we had been calling free software that wouldn't turn people off, that wouldn't turn people in suits and eyes off. And like open source is the best thing we came up with. Okay? So that's why we've been promulgating that label ever since. Because it doesn't scare people. It doesn't weird them out. It doesn't make them think of communards yards pumping their fists <laughs> in barricades. <laughs> so, and, and that kind of thing is important. Language is important. Image is important. In fact, in the domain we're talking about now, it's more important than reality. <laughs> now, that's real tough for techies to swallow, the idea of image being more important than reality. But when you're marketing to people who aren't techies, it's true. And make no mistake, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about marketing. Okay? And yeah, that really makes me feel kind of queasy too. But the fact is, I made a basic decision. This time, I'm going to do whatever it takes to win because I'm tired of losing. And if you're as tired of losing as I am, well, I don't have to put it that negatively anymore because we've actually started winning. If you like winning instead of losing, you need to think about these things. You need to think about learning some business school jargon. So that instead of walking into a CIO's office and saying, free software is really cool, you ought to use it, you can say things like, you know, if you were to go with something with the, like, the proven high knee time between failures in a Linux kernel, you'd be reducing your business risks pretty substantially. Hear the difference? Yeah. Okay. You need to learn to think that way. You need to learn to talk that kind of language. There's something else you need to learn to do. Uh, and this is, 
you need to eradicate the prejudice, which is very prevalent among techies. Techies often have a prejudice that business people are stupid. <laughs> and if this prejudice is lurking in your brain pan, you need to get rid of it. And now I'll explain why. The first reason that you need to get rid of it is that it's not true. Business people are not stupid. They're simply selected for solving a different class of optimizations than techies are. Your typical techie couldn't do what the typical business guy does every day. Manage an organization, meet a payroll, deal with all the crap. In fact, many of us are techies because we don't want to deal with all the crap. Which means we should be a little respectful of those who are capable of it. So that's the first reason to get rid of the, the prejudice that business people are stupid. The second reason to get rid of the, the uh, prejudice that business people are stupid is because if you walk in and make a presentation to a business guy, and you can be making the most plausible pitch on a verbal level in the world, but if you've got the basic fix that the guy you're talking with is an idiot, it's going to leak through in your body language. The, the contempt is going to show. <laughs> and the whole interaction is just going to go suddenly bad, and neither of you is ever going to figure out really why it went bad. All he's going to know is that you kind of gave him the creepy crawlies, and all you're going to know is that you saw his eyes go blank and his brain shut down. <laughs> and neither of you is going to realize that it's because your contempt was showing. So you've got to get rid of the prejudice that the business people are stupid. If it helps, think of them as being differently able. <laughs> okay, so um, we're, it's 20 after 9. We've got to wrap this up. I'll finish this by giving my, like the three-minute version of my pitch to, to CIOs and CTOs. And this is where you walk into the, uh, the, the CTO's office and say, Hi there, Mr. CTO. Here are the three reasons why you should demand open source from every single one of your vendors. Reason number one, reliability, stability, and costs. Uh, if you, uh, if, when you buy closed source, first of all, um, you're deliberately putting yourself at the wrong end of a monopoly relationship with your supplier. Because by definition, there's only one firm that can fix your software, that can extend your software, that can address your problems with your software. Would you accept being at the wrong end of a monopoly with any other kind of business partner? Would you have board consider that responsible behavior? And if you do that, what makes you think you're going to end up with any other behavior than perpetually increasing price gouging and perpetually increasing locking? Fundamentally, if, 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 if your critical business functions are being executed by software that you can't, not only can't modify, but can't even see inside, you don't control your business. Okay. That's an important pitch to make because as you go up the corporate hierarchy, you'll find that people are less and less concerned with managing money and more and more concerned with managing risk. They're more and more concerned with not being blindsided by factors they can't control. So the most powerful argument to make is that open source is a way to control your risks so that you're no longer at the mercy of a monopoly supplier. Say, the, the, the scenario you want to pitch, I'm going to condense this even further than I was planning, is that if you face a choice between open source and closed source, you face a choice between being at the wrong end of a monopoly relationship on the one hand, and on the other hand, being in a situation where multiple service companies are competing for your business, you have control of your software, you own the sources, you can play the service companies off against each other, and if none of them satisfy you, you've at least got the option of hiring a few more programmers doing, and doing the maintenance yourself. But the key point is, nobody can take that software away from you. That is the pitch that will sell your average CIO because you give him back.
control his business. So on that note, I'll observe that it's 925, and thank you all for listening.